hi there. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many people coming out on a Sunday afternoon to talk about words, basically, to listen to words. I'm here to, to tell you the, the wisest thing I've ever been told, but it will take a little time. Bear with me. I was born in a house full of stories. Actually, I was born in a house from a sitcom. Imagine this. If I was pitching this to um, a TV company, imagine a corner sweet shop in Barnsley, owned, yeah, I know, owned by two old people who have never been abroad, who don't own a single book, who left school at 10 and 12. Into this sweet shop come two talented young academics, a man and a woman who are married. The man happens to be the son of the elderly couple. The woman happens to be French. She doesn't speak English. The elderly couple don't speak French. It was a stage for farce, a stage for tragedy, and this was where I was born. And so I came into the world surrounded by different conflicting stories and different conflicting pieces of advice from my Barnsley side, which was intensely practical, and then from my French side, which really wasn't. My mother had been brought up among books, among poetry, among theatres. My grandparents, well, my grandmother was in service and my grandfather was a minor. And he's the one I'm going to talk about mostly today, although he is not the one who gave me the wisest piece of advice I've ever been given. That was somebody else altogether. My grandfather was, was a man of contradictions. And he looked after me when I was a child because my parents both worked. And he told me lots of interesting and very often quite wise things. Most of them I ended up disagreeing with, but they were wise anyway. I actually think he disagreed with some of them. The first one was this. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I thought even at the time, this is quite an interesting thing to hear, because I don't think even he believes this. Words can hurt you. Words can hurt you in all sorts of interesting ways, far more than sticks and stones. He also said things like, do it yourself, because otherwise nobody else will do it for you. Which again was, was an interesting thing because it implied being alone in the world. And I had never met anybody before who was entirely alone in the world. We lived in a little community where everybody knew everybody else, where everybody helped everybody else. And the other thing that he always said was look after number one, which again was a bit of a joke because my grandfather was always looking after other people. And so I took his advice with a pinch of salt and with some curiosity because I could see that he'd laid out these rules and he was already breaking them without even knowing that he was breaking them. And I was born in a house filled with stories that were not necessarily from books, which were from people. My grandfather told me stories about being a miner. My mother told me stories about being in occupied France during the war. My grandmother told me stories about being a servant in a big house in Oxfordshire, a bit like Downton Abbey. And, and I took all these stories in because that's what I did. Children are little sponges. They live on stories, don't they? And, and of course, there were fairy stories. And I heard about all the fairy stories that you and I know, Jack and the Beanstalk and Little Red Riding Hood and Cinderella. But I was told every time somebody told me these stories that life is not a story, and that I had to be very careful with stories and not confuse them with the real thing. When I got to school, I found that most of my teachers repeated this advice and said to me, you know, you really have to spend less time daydreaming because it will never get you anywhere. Of course, it's got me here, <laughs> which is both good and bad if you look at it, but daydreaming will not get you anywhere. And there was a kind of conflicting current of advice going around about words and stories. Words will never hurt you. Don't tell stories. Because in those days, telling stories and telling lies were pretty much considered the same thing. Maybe they still are. The idea that life is not a story. Recently, I read in one of the papers a piece by Noel Gallagher in which he rather shrilly denounced fiction. You may have seen it, it was in Esquire, and then later on it turned up in The Guardian, uh, and it was immediately <laughs> taken seriously because that's where it was. Um, 
And I think he said something on the lines of, well, fiction's rubbish. He didn't quite put it that way, but you know the power of words. Um, fiction is rubbish because it's not true. The thing is, when I was at school, not really paying a lot of attention to my teachers and thinking mostly about stories and dreaming in my head, I realized that actually most stories are true, even when they don't seem to be true. There is something about the structure of story, which even when it is obviously not talking about the truth, still holds important truths. Because this is the power of words. It's a kind of double power. A story that you will have heard of, which sold an awful lot more copies than any of mine, begins with the words in the beginning was the word. And whether you take that story as completely true, partially true, amusingly metaphorical or otherwise, there is no denying that that phrase says something about the creative and transformative power of words. And as I grew up and started to understand words and started to read books, I realized that words can be the world's biggest Lego set. You can make anything out of words that you want. You can make a rocket ship that will take you to the stars. You can make a Ouija board that will raise the dead. You can build. You can communicate, because actually this is what stories are all about. They are about communicating things. My very earliest stories were all about my family. These were allowed by my grandfather, who was a great cynic when it came to books, having really never been to school. But they were allowed because they were something about our family's history. And the stories that were told to me were really about introducing me to people that I would otherwise never have known, people who had died, people who were halfway across the world, people that I had to have some kind of contact with to understand them, to understand where I came from. And those were stories about the family. Those were histories. And I heard them, and I heard them over and over again until eventually those people became real to me, even though some of them I was never going to meet. And they were stories that brought the dead to life to me and made sure that they were never going to be forgotten. Now, my grandfather, who didn't quite despise books, but certainly distrusted the sort of things that you found in books, had a secret. He had under his bed a big cache of National Geographic magazines. These did not count as books because they were educational. And occasionally, I would go into his bedroom and look at these magazines and read about places that I'd never been, places that he had never been, but he would have liked to have gone. Actually, I don't think he ever really made it beyond Yorkshire. But that was how he traveled in his mind. Books can take you to other places, even if it's only in the imagination. And we'll get back to the only in the imagination thing, because actually the imagination is greatly underrated and is probably more powerful than any other resource we have. When I was at school and I was daydreaming and my teachers said that I would never amount to anything if I considered life to be like a story, um, I realized a number of things about stories. For a start, they are a kind of escape. They are doors that you can open and go anywhere to. At the time, I didn't travel much. Nowadays, stories have taken me all over the place, in places I never would have imagined I could have gone. But in those days, I knew Yorkshire and I knew France, or at least I knew the little part of France that my family lived in, and that was it. But those stories took me everywhere. And they opened doors to places. They opened avenues of communication to, to people that I would never have met. And I became more and more obsessed with the kind of people who tell stories and why they tell stories. One of my great heroes at the time was Ray Bradbury. One of the things he said about stories was, I write so as not to be dead. And I wondered what that meant when I read it age nine. And then I realized that what he said was he was writing so that he would live forever. And he died last year. But you can open any of his books, and there he is, and his voice is just as strong and powerful as it ever was, and he will not be forgotten because of that, because his stories are still alive, still inspiring people, still making themselves heard. C.S. Lewis said, we read so as not to be alone, and I think this is also true of writing. Stories are about enabling people to communicate with each other. Stories create empathy. You were just hearing about Africa, about Asia, about areas where there are such terrible problems that 
a lot of the time we, we feel unable to cope with those things and we kind of block them out of our minds because they're just too big for us to handle. We live in a society where most of the time most of us feel completely disempowered, disconnected from everything and from everybody and the problems of the world just seem so huge that we tell ourselves that alone as we are, there is not very much we can do to change them. This isn't true at all, because as soon as you introduce story into that, people start to respond. A whole continent of suffering is too much for people to take, conceptually. We can't get our, our ideas around that. But you, you tell the story of one person, and you get people to know that one person, and then all of a sudden, empathy is created, channels of communication are created, people want to help, people come out to help. You've seen this happen on the internet. You've seen people tell their stories on YouTube. Um, you have seen people come out and make astonishingly generous donations to people they don't know just because somebody has told them a story. And I happen to think that fact or fiction, basically it doesn't really matter because behind every piece of fiction there's a truth. Even the truth behind fairy stories, which we as adults have been brought up to be slightly suspicious of. Originally, fairy stories were not written for children, they were written for adults. They were written for people with profoundly troubled, difficult, harsh, bleak lives. They were written for people who, who were afraid, who needed something to help them cope with the difficulties that they had to endure on a day-to-day -day basis. They listened to stories of monsters and princes and dragons and witches, not because they necessarily believed in those things, but because they believed in the truth behind those things. They wanted to believe that love can save us, that we can go on personal quests of self-discovery and find things out about ourselves, that monsters, whatever kind of faces we choose to put on our monsters, can be overcome that there can be a happy ever after. Because we need to believe those things. We needed them then, we need them now. We need stories more than we ever did. And the immense power of story is something... Well, you've heard of chaos theory. You have heard of the butterfly effect. The concept that the flutter of a butterfly's wing on one continent can affect the passage of a tornado on another. And stories have a very similar effect to chaos effect, to the butterfly effect. The flutter of a butterfly's wing is not that different to the turning of a page. We can affect the way the world behaves through stories. We can affect the way other people behave through stories. I never knew that I was going to end up here writing stories for a living. It wasn't supposed to happen. I was genetically predestined to be a teacher. My French grandfather was a teacher, my mother was a teacher, my father was a teacher. Everything pointed to my being a teacher. And then something happened and I ended up here. I ended up writing stories for a living, doing everything that I had been told that I shouldn't, couldn't make a living doing. And I realized that we are all made of stories. And I shall tell you just one. One little story, one of many, many, many stories that make up my life and yours and some of us will intersect in all sorts of ways that we may not yet be aware of. But this is one example of the, the chaos effect of stories. And it will lead me to the, the wisest thing I ever heard. Sometime in around 1985, I got an abscess in my tooth and I was waiting in the dentist's surgery and there was, there was a paper there which I read. And in it, there was an article by A.A. A. Gill, who is not a writer that I particularly admire in many ways, but this article was a fantastic, angry, beautiful piece of writing about sleeping sickness in Africa. And it was about how this disease is totally fatal if it's not treatable, that it is totally treatable, that, however, the treatment has is too expensive for most African countries to even envisage, and therefore, where it is treated, when it is treated, which isn't all the time, 
people have gone back, have reverted to a sort of dreadful intravenous solution of arsenic, which kills 70% of the people that it's given to, and the others have a little chance of survival. And it was such a powerful piece, because this is a man who knows how to use words, that I thought at that time, and, and I was working as a teacher, I had no way of knowing where I was going to end up in life, I thought, you know, if I ever do anything, if I ever make enough money to make a difference, I will try and do something about this awful disease that I'd never heard of before. And time passed. Lots of things happened. And finally, I got to give up my teaching job and, and write stories for a living. And astonishingly for me, one of my little stories, a story called Chocolat, grew wings and flew all over the world and flew to 50 countries and took me all over the place. And and I, I'd never known that before. I never knew that stories had that kind of power. And from that book, which was metaphorically themed around food, came many rare requests for readers for me to send them recipes. Now, I am not a cookbook writer. I am not a celebrity chef. But I thought, you know, I got so many of these requests that finally I thought, okay, I'm going to write a cookbook. And you know what? I'm going to give this money to charity. Who deals with sleeping sickness? And actually, I wrote two cookbooks, and I gave the money to Médecins Sans Frontières, which, as it happened, had an outreach program in the Congo that was dealing with sleeping sickness. And that in itself was a story. And they flew me over there, in fact, to write a piece about it. And so I went there, and, and it was the first time I'd been to anywhere like that. And, and I had adventures there. I went up the Congo River in a, a hollow canoe. I, I got attacked by bandits. I got bitten by a crocodile. Um, all sorts of interesting things happened. And I met, well, I met all sorts of people. Every one was made of stories, every one, because I'd become a kind of collecting bag of, of stories. So that everywhere I went, people told me stories because actually that's the way we communicate. That's the way we share our human experience, because it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Stories remain essentially the same. They are still about combating monsters, love saving us, the hope of a happy ending. And halfway down the Congo River, I met an old man who said he was God. He is not the person who gave me the wisest piece of advice that I've <laughs> ever had, but he did apologize. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, I know the world's in a bit of a state, but I've been really busy. <laughs> and a little bit further down the river, I met an old woman, a very, very old woman, she must have been in her 90s, and for the Congo, where basically the average age is 19, she was, she, was older than, she was older than God. And she had sleeping sickness, and she was going to die. Now, in the West, we don't often get the chance to make a difference to things. We do feel isolated and powerless. And I found during my thoroughly adventurous and in many cases uncomfortable trip down the Congo, I found that in that situation where I was, that wasn't quite true because those doctors that I was traveling with, every time they stopped at a village, they would screen the whole of the population of the village and anybody they found who had sleeping sickness, they would cure, either with the short cure or with the long cure. They had managed to get hold of some proper antibiotics, and, and every single person that they, they, they caught with sleeping sickness, they saved their lives. It was a question of how many lives have you saved today? And I met this very, very old woman, and she had sleeping sickness in its, its worst possible form, and she, she was going to die. But they caught her in time, and they took her to a hospital, and, and they cured her. It took a long time. She, she was there for nearly a week, and I talked to her, and we exchanged stories, because that's what you do when you have very little but story in common. And I noticed that all her family had come to sit around her. And, and at first I thought it was very touching, that they'd all come to support her. And then I came and, and moved closer, and I realized that actually they weren't supporting her. They were saying, Mother, your time has come. These people don't want to waste any more time on you. You're nearly 100. And she was saying, no. I shall outlive you all. <laughs> and I hope she did, because when she left, that was also the day I left. And we had been talking about what had brought me here. Basically, a story, several stories. And she believed in magic. Um, she believed in it in a very 
African way. She believed that magic was in everything. And, and we discussed this quite a lot. And she went off with all her possessions into the jungle. And I went off my way. And before she left, she turned round and she said to me, we are all made of stories and they are all magic. And that was the wisest thing that anybody has ever said to me. Because actually, when you think about it, that little story of mine, that story of A.A. A. Gills, every single person who read my book and turned the pages and caused that butterfly effect, they did that. They saved her. They saved all those other people too. And they did all sorts of other things, the effects of which may not be known, may never be known. But basically, this is why we tell you, read books, tell stories, communicate, keep the libraries open, keep those pages turning, because one story at a time, you are, we are, all of us, changing the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>